one extremely overlooked issue within the Muslim community is sexualizing gender interactions. And what I mean is sometimes when we see a man and woman interact, we assume or come to the conclusion that the reason why they're interacting is for sexual desires or sexual intentions, or they might fall into sexual acts solely based off of just a man and a woman interacting. And this sometimes comes from an innocent place because in, in the Quran it says, you know, لا تقربون الزنا, which is like, don't even get near uh, zina and a man and a woman interacting might be getting near there and, and you know so on and so forth um, but uh, that simplified uh, logic um, especially when you're extremely applying it creates a lot of issues within the community um, sometimes it even creates more haram or creates more zina and that's what I want to talk about today um, is is what are the some what are the problems that the applying this uh, simplified logic in the community and what are you know some solutions that we can apply um, here's the reality uh, Whenever you just see a woman and a man interact and you assume that it's for haram reasons, you've already fallen into another sin of assumption, right? Islam is very much against assumption, especially when there is no evidence. Just because you think someone is potentially committing haram, it doesn't mean that they're uh, committing haram, nor does it mean that you are allowed to do anything about it. Not only is Islam very much against assumptions, especially without evidence, but also guessing people's intentions. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows uh, our intentions. We don't even know what our pure and true intentions are. And so whenever we are claiming to know other people's intentions, it almost sounds like we're claiming a bit of divinity because if only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you're claiming to know, are you challenging God's knowledge and your own? This also potentially creates more zina or actually makes it harder for people to fall in zina. And I, bear with me for a second here, but if if we're teaching people unintentionally or intentionally that when you see a man or woman interact, it must be for sexual intentions, then what that causes is, is our youth and just people in general to see the opposite gender only for sexual intentions, right? Like, like there's nothing else you can do with the opposite gender except commit zina <laughs> or, 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 you know, or commit a sexual act with, which is horrible because then our young men and women, whenever they're in scenarios where they're inter interacting with opposite gender, all they can think about is sex because that's all that we are teaching. Another really overlooked negative consequence to this is that sometimes we overlook when our children are interacting with the same sex. We're thinking that, oh, everything is good and halal and yeah, because it's just our young boy playing with other boys or our young girl playing with other girls. But the sad thing is there is a lot of haram that sometimes happens within the same gender and Look, the haram that can be done between a man and a woman can also be done between a man and a man. And uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of those issues going on within our communities and outside of our communities. And we can't just simply overlook it simply on the basis, oh, it's just a, a young boy playing with other young boys, right? Because I've, I've seen this before where um, sometimes where communities are very small and there's not a lot of options when it comes to friends. Um our children are being forced to hang out with people just because they're the same gender, but that group of friends or group of people are doing haram, you know, or they're doing bad things. And it's not Allah, just, you know, sexual. It could be other things in general. But we overlook it simply on the basis that, you know, it's just a bunch of people of the same gender hanging out with each other. To sum it all up, we have vilified and sexualized a simple interactions that when it came to the time of the Prophet and even the Sahaba, we saw many interactions between the opposite gender. Not that it was limitless, not that it wasn't without manners or uh, you know appropriate approaches, but that's the problem. We're not teaching that there is appropriate ways of interacting with the opposite gender. Sometimes we're teaching the extent that no, just interacting with the opposite gender is bad. It's haram. You should not do it. It really confuses me because you see Muslims outside of our community interacting with the opposite gender so professionally, so amazingly, so comfortably. We should feel even more comfort interacting with our own people within our own community. Why do we feel more uncomfortable within our community than we are outside of it? I'm not saying there's no haram or no zina that happens outside of our community. Of course there is. But what I'm saying is it seems to be a lot easier to interact with the opposite gender without any sexual intentions or actions outside of our community than it is within our own community.
Let me give you an example of a story that I went through. Once I was outside of the masjid, literally right outside of the masjid, kind of in a circle formation with both men and women, and we were interacting, we were laughing, we were talking. No one was touching or cuddling. <laughs> we were just standing there having a conversation. And uh, a random person came up to me, grabbed me by my arm, um, and they grabbed my arm really, really hard, and they pushed me to the side. My mind was running through a lot of things. Number one, I didn't know who grabbed me until I looked and I saw it was, it was a friend of mine. And number two, I was like just running in my head like, whoa, what, what is going on? You know, this, this feels really uncomfortable. What's happening? I was trying to come up with conclusions because, you know, being involved in the community, sometimes, you know, members come up to me with really, you know, deep and, and, and needs, you know. Um, it's not surprising when I get a phone call of, oh my God, we're worried about this brother. You know, he might commit suicide you know that's some halal or oh my god we're, we're really in need of you you know it, it happens to me a lot um but at the same time you know i have my own personal life and experiences and my own traumas of someone when someone grabs me like that i, I get like anxious and worried um so i thought when this person grabbed me i, I was about to hear something a really huge uh, big reason why they grabbed me so aggressively and I asked the brother, oh my God, what, what's going on? He took me to the side and he was like, you're, you're interacting with a sister, be careful, blah, blah, blah. Like he was, he was sweaty and nervous and I, I was just so confused. After he calmed down and I'm like, hey, what's going on here? He said, hey, I just saw you interacting with women and I wanted to protect you. When I heard that, I was I was extremely angry. And I my first question was, brother, did you see me do something haram? He said, no, I saw you potentially doing something haram. And I said, okay, everyone in this masjid, everyone in this building is potentially doing something haram. The people praying are potentially praying to a different God. The people donating are potentially donating for wrong intentions. The people reading Quran are potentially reading it with, you know, bad words. Astaghfirullah Like, like, Everyone has potential to do haram. It is not a justification to act inappropriately or make someone feel uncomfortable just because you're afraid they might be doing something haram, right? That That, that is not a justification. That is uh, not enough to just grab someone randomly, aggressively, violently to, to protect them from something that is not even there, right? You just think it might be there. Um, and, and to me, alhamdulillah, I mean, I have a great community, you know, great connection with my community. And an action like that is not going to prevent me from going to the masjid. However, that would prevent a lot of people. And you know, what's funny is what was happening was um, I was with the Reaver organization and someone in that group um, had gone through a divorce and the person that they divorced uh, was getting married again that day. And so it was really important for us to come together and distract that person, you know, from, you know, from the struggles and the difficulty of, of, of that happening. Um, and, Firstly, I don't need to give anyone an explanation of what I am doing if I'm not harming anyone, if I'm not doing anything haram. But just to give y'all context, if that person grabbed that individual that was going through a tough time, that would have been detrimental. That would have been horrible. And that's the type of things that we need to avoid doing in the community. We need to avoid doing in the masjid is we have enough like haram we have to worry about. We have enough difficulties that we have to worry about. We don't need to create any more problems for ourselves. We don't need to create any more worries for ourselves. This does not help prevent zina. This just causes more problems. Real quickly, if you're enjoying this video, please like, share, and subscribe. I want to continue making videos like this, and those subscriptions really do help out. We as a community cannot do this. We cannot vilify our interactions with each other if there is no haram happening. I'm absolutely not stating that same gender interactions and opposite gender interactions are completely similar and, and mannerisms and practice it's similar. It's absolutely not. But in reality, there's not that much difference. You know, we in Islam, every interaction must have a purpose. We, we generally teach like, oh, if you're interacting with the opposite gender, it, you shouldn't do it. But if you do it, there has to be intention and purpose behind it. 
no, that that statement applies to same gender interactions. There should be purpose in every interaction that you have. There should be intention behind every single interaction that you have, regardless if it's man or woman. There might be different rules and different applications and different mannerisms, but in general, every single interaction that you have in this world, whether it may be with opposite gender or same gender, whether it may be with your brother or your sister or your husband or your wife, there are rules, there are regulations that we have in Islam. There are mannerisms, there are good practices that you have to take into consideration. There is no one gender that is everything is haram and the other gender everything is halal. That is not how Islam works. We shouldn't just be teaching this and that as haram. Sometimes Islam is, hey, in certain circumstances, this is haram. In certain circumstances, this is halal. We should teach our youth and members of our community in what scenarios is it appropriate to interact with the opposite gender? And how do you interact with the opposite gender? What are what are things you should take into considerations? What are good practices? We really also have to understand that it is very good to look at potential haram, but potential haram is not equivalent to haram. So you can't apply the same you know, actions to the two. For example, someone can go to the masjid with haram intentions. That is a potential haram. That does not mean that you go out in the masjid and prevent people from coming in. That is not your right. It's just an issue that you need to find ways to address, but it does not justify inappropriate actions. Now let's go back to the ayah of la taqribun and zina. Now I'm, I'm not a scholar or a faqi. This is just lessons that I have learned. So please take this a grain of salt. And essentially you need to do your own research. But when it comes to um, rulings that are not like strictly quantitative, right? Like for example, uh, when it comes to pork, it's haram to eat. It's very straightforward. But la taqribun and zina is very, um, not interpretational. That's not what I'm saying. What I mean is it's very differently applied to every single individual. For example, when a man went up to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and asked if it was, you know, if he is allowed to kiss his wife um, during Ramadan or not, uh, uh, Muhammad وسلم, said, yes, it is allowed. But when another man came by, asked him the same question, he said, you know, can I? Muhammad وسلم, no, you shouldn't. Um, and when the Sahaba asked Muhammad وسلم, like, well, why'd you give, you know, different answers to these different people? And the response was, or the wisdom behind this response, the teaching behind this response is that one man was able to control himself and to not, you know, doing, having sex essentially, uh, before breaking uh, his fast, the other one could, meaning that those two people, because they have different controls over themselves, they have different, um, limits, have different actions. This is exactly how we should apply la taqribuna zina. There are some people who are able to interact with the opposite gender without having ill will or ill intentions or they they don't have the fear of committing zina. Other people can't. And that is completely fine. I think it's absolutely amazing that if you are someone that you can't handle it and you feel like you shouldn't interact with the opposite gender, that is absolutely fine. That is totally okay. It's what works best for you in avoiding haram. However, if your limitation is maybe more strict than others because that's just you know how uh, the world came to be, it does not justify you apply your limitations to others. For example, that man that uh, uh, shouldn't kiss his wife before Ramadan can't go to the man that can kiss his wife before, not before Ramadan, before breaking the fast. He can't go up to that man and says, hey, it's haram for you to kiss your wife because I shouldn't kiss my wife, therefore you shouldn't kiss your wife before breaking fast. No, that is not how Islam works. Just because you have limitations doesn't mean that you need to apply it to others. At the end of the day, there are many things within our community that requires both genders to come together and interact with each other to build a bigger and better community. And in some scenarios, in some situations, that shouldn't happen. But it's going to be different to every single person, and it's going to be different for every single community. We can't treat everything in a cookie-cutter manner. A part of this is a personal journey. You need to figure out where your limitations are because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't tell us every single thing. There are some challenges that are left for us to overcome. We have the Prophet Muhammad and the Sahaba عنهم, to follow in, in their footsteps and we see that there were many interactions that were done and we see a lot of examples where they limited interactions. We need to follow what they're doing and apply their lessons in today's world. We can't just look at the halal and haram in Islam. We also need to look at what is the appropriate ways and measures that we as a community can do to implement the halal and to prevent the haram.